It's always been called the castle. Well, obviously the centuries have left their mark, and nowadays, if you really want to have a clear picture of what it used to look like, you need a slight effort of imagination. Still, there are quite a few reminders of its past glory, even if they don't catch the eye at first. First of all, have a look at the south facade of the dungeon tower, which has just been restored. And inside, on the first floor, the great state room of what used to be a magnificent building. If you walk around the islet, you'll see elements of the fortifications, parts of the curtain walls, and in particular, a northwest angle tower which has survived, and a large part of the north curtain wall. Then you'll start to realize how this used to be a large-scale building with a ground surface of about 1,500 square meters, and such an edifice could only have sheltered a great historical figure. And indeed, this was one of the holiday homes, or as the people of Capistan like to believe, the favorite holiday home of the Archbishop of Narbonne. This castle's days of glory had been forgotten for a very long time, even by the people of Capistan. That's because the castle went through many dormant periods through its history. And those times when Capistan was going through great hardships actually wiped out many traces of its past. The other point is that the local stone is not of great quality. This limestone is made of a variety of shales and has suffered a lot through the centuries. This may explain why the people of Capistan themselves, although they've always kept in mind that these were the remnants of their castle, they grew to despise it. It's only in the last few years when outsiders with an expert eye pointed out that this was indeed a very interesting historic site that little by little people started to make it their own again. What you're looking at now is something no one could see up to a little while ago. Here are proofs that at least two archbishops stayed here at two different times in history. The first one is the beginning of the 14th century, with the Archbishop of Narbonne, Bernard de Fargue, who was no less than Pope Clement V's nephew. Bernard de Fargue brought many adjustments to this room. For instance, he was responsible for the wall paintings which are still partly visible. Also, this room's floor was higher than the one you're standing on now, which was lowered later on, but the former level is indicated by the archbishop facing you and who's coming from his private chambers. This room, which is 20 meters long and 8.4 meters wide, was undoubtedly a prestigious place at the time, for we know that in 1430 it held a session of the Languedoc État Généraux where representatives from every religious and civil authorities discussed the general state of affairs of the region. Major works occurred again in this room in the 15th century, with the visits of two archbishops, Jean and Louis d'Arcourt, who were successively heads of the episcopal throne from 1436 to 1460. With them, these premises underwent profound transformations. Jean d'Arcourt commissioned the ceiling you can see above your head. He was the one who decided to cover Bernard de Fargue's paintings with a coat of emulsion which still exists on the north wall, and through it you can glimpse parts of the original paintings. But Jean d'Arcourt did more. He also decided to split this room in three parts. If you look at the last beam on the far side, you can see on the left-hand side of that beam a lighter shade indicating where a partition used to stand. Now, if you look at the second last beam, underneath it you can spot several notches where a series of tenons and mortises used to hold further partitions. In fact, instead of one room, you had three. Well, first there used to be a corridor. The archbishop is stepping into it now. Near the fireplace, there was a pretty small room which was possibly used on a daily basis when there was no distinguished visitor. You can spot its layout thanks to the traces left by the black smoke on the beams. And finally, there was the state room, about 100 square meters only, which went from the second last beam to the spot where we are now. 
The ceiling is a perfect example of those many long neglected works that people are slowly uncovering everywhere and which are of the highest quality, and this is especially true of the Mediterranean regions. It is typical of the 14th and 15th century ceilings in Languedoc. The master beams are from pine trees cut down in 1446. They display decorative paintings with interlaced designs, stylized plants, and you may also spot the Archbishop d'Arcourt's coat of arms. But the main feature of these ceilings is the quality of the closoir seals, those wooden plates lodged between two rafters up there. Originally, there were over 200 of them. Over a hundred have survived, and they're easy to examine. Let's look at those closoir plates above our heads. They're 40 cm long by 20 cm wide each. But these could only be seen from a far distance, as the floor used to be 4.5 meters lower. Therefore, the artists had to find tricks so that people could make out their subjects. That's how they used graphic shortcuts like those you find in comic strips. They outlined the figures with thick black lines. They played with contrasts, with simple lines and a great attention to face expressions. You'll notice that these paintings haven't been restored, and, and yet through all those centuries, they've kept surprisingly bright hues. They were probably made around 1450. And the diversity of themes is quite surprising. Diverse animals, many birds, and in particular numerous wading birds. But also, apart from all these real animals, there's a whole imaginary bestiary of a striking creativity here. Now, there's also a number of scenes showing the social life of the 15th century, both in the aristocratic class and among the common people. In fact, one feels that the whole universe is concealed behind these surprisingly varied scenes and subjects. It's the personal worldview of a 15th century high-ranking clergyman. Now look, when we're shown a dog, it's a greyhound, an aristocrat's dog. When we're shown a bird, it's often a wading bird. So the assertion of a social rank seems clear here. Likewise, the assertion to devote the closoir seals of a whole beam to the coat of arms of the Narbonne chapter and the Dark Horse. Not everyone could become Archbishop of Narbonne. As we've seen, Bernard de Fargue was the Pope's nephew. Louis d'Arcourt, he celebrated Charles VII's funerary mass. So these were important characters. And here these characters display their need to assert their rank. That would explain the numerous courtly love or hunting scenes, which may be a surprise coming from an archbishop who's not supposed to hunt and who's not necessarily the most qualified person to evoke courtly love. But that's not all. Beside all these aristocratic scenes, there are others showing how we are indeed dealing here with a clergyman living in the 15th century, a time when religious dread was great. Now, we should be wary. That's how our 21st century outlook may mislead us and make us bypass essential things. Now, we're looking at a very explicit scene here. A woman is lying naked with her hand upon her sex. It's very clear as to how she's been behaving, right? She definitely embodies lust. She is in a position that a clergyman may see as suggestive. It may be unexpected, but look at the very menacing heads surrounding her. One seems ready to swallow her head and the other her legs. Now look at these heads closely. They are those of the Leviathans. This is hell. So this is not just a statement from a master who wished to assert his social rank. Even though the explicitly religious scenes seem very few here, there's also an omnipresent moral message, it seems to me. People would generally pass by, unaware, because these preoccupations are so remote from our life. They just don't see it. But for instance, let's look at the beam that is generally called the dance's beam. It's the second last one. It is designed symmetrically. It may be the most accessible to us. If you look closely, in the center are the musicians with drums and bagpipes. On each side, the same dancing couple is pictured in different dance moves. But the further you go from the center, the more surprising the scenes become. Now, framing these dancing couples, four on each side, you can see the fool. He displays a very peculiar attitude. Apparently, he's here to demonstrate his sarcastic and slightly frightening laugh. He's there on the left and on the right, framing the dancers. This is definitely veering into something else entirely. At first, this seemed more or less like a gallant festivity, and then 
Quite suddenly, an element of dread is seeping in with the fool. But let's look at the extremities of the beam. Here, we're dealing with a world of total fantasy: a mammal with a bird's beak, a bird with a humanoid head. Many of the fantasy animals pictured on the ceiling they bear the same features: a human head on top of an animal body. Well, is this just chance? Maybe not. Isn't there a pretty clear moral stance here? Are we not being told that certain human beings eventually behave like beasts? You may object that this interpretation is unfounded. Well, maybe not. Now look at the beam's right extremity and at the crow holding it. Look closely. You'll spot the same hellish jaws as those that enclosed the lustful woman. Now that you've spotted this, look at the other two beams that have survived. You'll see that each beam's extremities bear the same leviathan jaws. Therefore, the archbishop was making a moral statement, and it's clear that he was giving his contemporaries a warning, reminding them that the true life, the one that holds any worth, was not on this earth.